Welcome back with open arms to the making of the Rolling Stones' Beggar's Banquet album, part two. I had no idea where part two was going to go, and as I dove deeper and deeper, it just got longer and longer. And it's really about the album cover photo session and Sympathy for the Devil and Godard's movie and how it was made and information about it. A lot of details to break this down, along with the song, the lyrics, the music. You're going to enjoy this. You go sit back and relax. And those of you who are donators, thank you. Thank you. I have a message for you of a special project I'll be working on just for you. And those of you who are thinking about donating, you'll be involved too. Please consider a donation for Flipside CT here through PayPal, as this takes a hell of a lot of work for me. Thank you. Make them show the pilot, wash his hand, seal his face. First thing I want to mention is I was called out on something from a fellow YouTuber who I respect, and I had to dig deep. As they pointed out, Ry Cooter was not with the Stones in 68 and not playing with them and not at the Redlands until 69. This also includes Anita's story, which would take place in 69. I did point out that I was not sure the timeline, so this is a full correction to make sure I got it right because I do take everything seriously. So also there were pictures of Rye Cooter at the Redlands. That was 69. So we got that straight and just want to make sure you, the viewers, knew this. The two folks that helped me out with this was the Brian Jones Resource YouTube channel. I've talked about him before. Does a great job. And also, there's a new podcast out called The Rye Cooter Story. And who else would know besides Rye? I talked to him also and got some information. And I found out the connection on how Rye and Jack Nietzsche and how they met. Rye met Jack while he did work for Terry Melcher. Looks like in 1967, while working as a studio musician with the band called The Gentle Soul. That's who we hear in the background. Jack also worked on a tune, and it's called Tell Me Love. Now, Terry Melcher, he was a California record producer known for the Beach Boys, the Birds. He did plenty of work and contribution to rock and roll music and other things. Jack would use Rye for so many sessions of working. He would not get credit for much of it, though. He's even on the Monkees album called Head As We Go Along. This tune also includes Neil Young on guitar. It's pretty sweet. Well, Rye was also contributing to the movie Candy, but it was rejected. So he did about 20 albums and singles all together between 68 and 69. Working, like I said, in the studio all the time. He could not even remember who he worked with the day before. He would just go in and leave. Sounds similar to like what Jimmy Page did in the early 60s. And he was just on the low visibility end. Going to introduce you to a new character in the Stone Sessions, Phil Brown. It was George Chikayans that would introduce Phil to Glenn Johns. Phil would work as a tape operator and assistant engineer and be at the Stone Sessions in June. Phil, being young and green, would pick up so much while working with Glenn. He would work with Glenn with traffic 
and the small faces and the move. In February of 68, working on Traffic's new album. Phil has a book out, Are We Still Rolling? Studios, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. A book that talks about his experiences and the Stone Sessions, among others. So Phil has a drawing that he made, a layout of the studio, shown here, which shows the studio and the control room. We did become more familiar as we did see Goddard's movie, Sympathy for the Devil, of what the studio did look like. It was Phil's first time he'd be working with the Stones. As a new outsider, he would say how easy it was and how friendly Bill, Charlie, and Brian were. No egos. Phil mentions how Brian was rumored to be drinking two bottles of scotch a day. Single malt. He talked about how he observed Brian being somewhat depressed state of mind and that he would spend a lot of time crouched on a low chair in his booth, hunched over his guitar, which he held high on his chest. It looked like he was having a difficult time keeping up in what was going on or even breathing properly. Phil wouldn't really communicate with Mick or Keith. Nicky, however, was an absolute sweetheart, he said. He would say he was mellow and relaxed and a real gentleman. Each song would have a run-through at first and rehearsed with Brian, Mick, and Keith. Then Bill and Charlie would come in when the verses and chorus were agreed upon, as we have seen in Goddard's movie. At that time frame, using studio effects were not available, so they would have to work at the source itself for recording. They would try out a few guitars and amp sounds and also microphones at various locations in the studio just to get it right. The band would really define their future and come into their own in this time period, a true personal growth spurt with this very young band. And they have grown quickly out of Oldham's pop mold and have the seeds start blooming quickly into what will define the Stones as the best rock and roll band in the world. So they're in Olympic still, working towards the end of the sessions with one more tune to develop. But more on that later. Now remember Christopher Gibbs from the Inner Circle, the one that was decorating Mick's Chelsea pad during the summer of 68? Well, Chris is the one to come up with the album's name and theme. They played around with Tramp's Mush Up. So along comes the photo session to meet the album's image. Chris would do the assistance too on this photo session set. So now the time is Friday and Saturday, June 7th and 8th. Keeping in mind the album's expectation for release now was going to be Mick's 25th birthday, July 26th. The location of the shoot was Sarum Chase, Hampstead, Northwest London. Sarum Chase was the home of the artist, painter, Frank O'Salisbury. The home was a neo-Tudor mansion built in the 1930s. When Salisbury passed in 62, the house was handed over to the British Council of Churches. They sold it. So at this exact time period, I'm not sure who owned it, but this is where the photo shoot started. It was known photographer Michael Joseph that was big in the advertising world with clients like Nivea, Benson and Hedges, Christie's, Pirelli, Malaysian Airlines, and Schweppes, to name a few. But what got him the gig was an ad he had in 1965 for White Horse Scotch Whiskey. 
It was posted all over London, and it had a real white horse in the picture. Michael had arrived at Sarum Chase early. He had art director Michael Peters with him and was setting up the set with props and some real food and also with Christopher Gibbs. Now it's thought that this photo shoot was inspired by a scene in the 1961 movie Viridiana by Louis Bunnell. It was a scene called Beggar's Banquet. And as you can see here, different beggars, but the feel's the same. So the lighting was set and placed perfectly. And Michael was talking to the animals that were on the set. There was goats, sheep, cats, three dogs. He had a megaphone, sort of like that old time Hollywood producer. So the banquet table was set, there was wine added also, and the whole dinner was laid out on that medieval banquet table. It was ready. They would have only two hours to do this shoot. The stones would all arrive on time at 11 a.m. The band was given choices of clothing to wear. They would be ready in about 10 minutes. Mick dressed as a swell, a person of high social position, Charlie as a stable groom, and the others were just medieval. No makeup was applied. Michael had positioned each stone. He would also talk about this shoot in an article in The Guardian, how Brian was having fun playing with the Labrador dog. Keith with his dog of choice, Michael had put out a real bowl of cherries, and he caught the goat eating it. He got some wonderful shots, as we see, capturing the moments. The band was very cooperative and all finished on time. As we know, this was the idea for the gatefold. The next day's shoot was to be in Swarkstone Hall Pavilion. That was in Derbyshire. Mick would ask Michael if he and his girlfriend, his wife-to-be, would want to drive with him and Marianne up to the pavilion. This was about a two-hour drive, and it was at a 17th century site. Michael would say that this location was scouted and chosen as it had the look, sort of a derelict look with the windows. Now the original intention for these photos were going to be for the album cover, front and back. So they were gonna start off with the back cover first. The stones would be playing cricket in a grass field. And then they would add a white three-legged piano as a prop. The Stones playing cricket is highly unlikely. I believe Brian, though, played when he was younger. But it was a tongue-in-cheek shot. Then on to the front cover. A photo of them just lying in the grass in front of the old pavilion. They would add some smoke. Now, some police would arrive thinking it was a fire, but they would be greeted by the mock setup. They would leave before Michael thought of using them as props. And I read in an interview of Michael, another one by Michelle Bob Paris. He said that while they were doing this shoot, Mick thought of the idea not to use any of these photos for the front or back of the album. Michael had a photo made from the first day shoot and he brought it with him. He wanted to have the band sign it while he had a chance. He used a Kodak Kodalith film, which is a super high contrast, 35 millimeter black and white. He also used a Hasselbad top of the line camera. But Mick saw this photo 
and he grabbed it, he snatched it away from Michael, and he loved it. He wanted it for himself. Actually, Mick gave Michael another promo picture and had that signed. But Mick saw it as it was in black and white, and he did feel it was a little bit dull. So he took this photo with him, and it was Tom Wilkes that had added that old-style photo coloring technique onto the faces. Tom was an art director and partner with photographer Barry Feinstein. More on that later. I want to now bring in Mick's brother, Chris Jagger. I don't want to take away from his wonderful seven-minute piece on YouTube. I'm going to post a link to it, and you could watch the full length. But he takes a visit to the photo shoot site, as it is today, and you hear the stories from fans. He also talks to Michael Joseph. Chris mentions that the pavilion, it can be rented out to stay in. As we know, that great hits album, Hot Rocks, three years later in 71, we get to use a photo from these sessions. We gotta hand it, an open hand, or better yet, a huge hug to Mary Ann. She was the catalyst for this next tune, among others. We have a new character, Lucifer, not regarding a lifestyle or a partner in crime, but he is used as a metaphor, the representation of the dark side of humanity. Mick would mention in 1995 in Rolling Stone about sympathy for the devil being an inspired by a French poet, Charles Baudelaire, but it is then acknowledged that it was brought on when Marianne would buy Mick a book. This is not new news. It's definitely out there. But for those who don't know, enjoy. This book was written by a Russian author, Mikhail Volgakov. He was born in Kiev in 1891. The book is The Master and Margarita. This novel was written over the time period of 1928 to 1940, shortly before his death. It would be considered a masterpiece by some in Russian literature. The manuscript would not be found until 1966. A censored Russian version was published in 66-67. I will supply you a brief description of the book's premise to get a feel for what Mick read and what was inspiring to him. There is a lot going on in here. So many twists, so many little subplots and information. So two men, the writers, authors, are sitting and discussing one of the other men's poems. They're sitting on a bench in Moscow, and one man is criticizing the other, saying he made Jesus look to be too real in his poem. Now, both these authors are atheists, and so the other writer defends his story, saying Jesus was not real and never existed. They were then interrupted by a foreigner, someone named Wolin. Yes, this was Satan. He introduces himself and says he was there. He witnessed what went on between Jesus and Pontius Pilate and the sentencing and execution. He also would say to one of the writers that they're going to die that day from a decapitation by being thrown under a train. And he did. What's really interesting is how this story does not reveal the devil as an evil character. The story takes place in Jerusalem, biblical times, but opens up in Moscow in the 30s. The book contains an array of mysticism, vanity, greed, and forthrightness. 
of the Soviet public. This story has so much deep meaning and drama and twists that I'm stopping right here. Due to Mick's mind expansion with intellectual achievement, he started his quest in developing an acoustic folk song. So what does Mick gather from all this? Well, he introduces an aristocrat type version of the devil. He's laying claims to historical tragedies like the Russian Revolution, Tsars, Bolsheviks, Lenin, massacres, the Hundred Year War, World War II, and of course the Kennedys. Mick would say the song is more about the darker side of man and is not a celebration of the devil at all. They, the Stones, would be accused of devil worship, of course, and corrupting influence on the youth. you got to remember the last album and what that was called. Mick is just pointing out the evils of mankind, but it gives the listener an actual finger-pointing to one culprit. Bottom line, it represents humanity and its evils. Charlie said the first time he heard Mick's new song in the front foyer of his Sussex home, they were having dinner and Mick was there. Mick played the entire song as the sun was setting and Charlie thought it was fantastic. The title was The Devil Is My Name. Now the original title that I am hearing also is Fallen Angels. Jean-Luc Godard, he wanted to make a film about abortion in London. But an abortion act was just legalized and passed. So it scratched that idea. So he was discussing with producers in London, coming over there, and he would want to work with the Beatles or the Stones. Now it takes so much time to break down Godard and reveal why and how he's one of the greats and respected directors out there during his time, a French new wave looking for a new method of expression and freedom. He had an improvised style along with radicalism in some films without a script. Our great producer, Jimmy Miller, had a friendship connection with a talent agent, Mim Scala. The Beggar's Connection is Mim introduced Jimmy to the band family. And as I mentioned, Jimmy went on to produce them. Jimmy had played Mim an early version demo of Sympathy for the Devil. There is another scenario of events that is not archived by timeline, so I can only piece it based on my observations. Godard was filming the riots and the protests that were going on in Paris. And Mim was in Paris also. He knew Godard and his work, and he had a conversation with Godard at dinner. Godard was not aware of the London protest scene that was going on concurrently. Mim must have known Godard wanted to make a new film. When Mim returned to London, he sent Godard a demo, the one that Jimmy gave him of Sympathy for the Devil, and he also sent him some Beatles albums. Mim then received a letter from the producer of Godar that he wants to make a movie with the Beatles or the Stones, as I said before. Mim just naturally asked for a script. The producer writes back, the film will have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not in that order. So Mim brought the idea to John Lennon, and he thought, okay, this might be cool. Godar was thinking about a film about Leon Trotsky, the Marxist revolutionary from 1905 and 17, opposition to Stalin. It would star John. Beatles will meet Godard for two meetings for this film. Eventually, Lenin turned him down and was very suspicious of Godard. So Mim had also brought the idea to the Stones agent, Sandy Levison, who passed it on to Mick and everyone else. Well, they just said, let's do it. Not sure what they were going to do, but they wanted to move ahead, and they wanted Godar. Keith would call him JLG in life and would say that he looked like a bank clerk. 
Well, eventually, Godard would say that he really wanted to work with the Stones more. They were perceived as more anarchists, given their past drug busts. Now, there is a tie-in for the Stones with Godard. In 1966, he made a movie called Made in USA, and it had Marianne in it, and she does sing. Falling on the ground I sit and watch As tears go by Mick had mentioned that there was a lot of meetings with the heads and Godar to have him identify what this movie was about. There was no real sign to identify this. Godar tried but he couldn't paint a picture or objective. He just said he wanted to create a new cinema, convert political dialect into film scripts. You can imagine the stone sitting there in a meeting and hearing this and saying, okay, okay, okay. But still, they had no idea and still no one had a clue. Godard would want to leverage the Stones working on a song in the studio and use that as a metaphor for growth, the beginning, and see how it progressed. He then would want to intermingle contrasting scenes of radical destruction versus the construction, which was the song. Well, the producers of what was to be the abortion film had gotten two financiers for Godard. The two were Ian Quarrier, a novice producer and an actor and director, and then also the son of an English lord, one of England's richest men, Michael Pearson. So the connection, Ian did know Mary Ann through her theater connections. The budget for this movie was 180,000 pounds. Goudard would arrive May 30th to London, despite really wanting to stay in Paris for the revolution and choose an unknown cinematographer, Tony Richmond, for this project. Well, Tony Richmond, he connected with the Stones already. He first met them while filming Jumpin' Jack Flash and Child of the Moon, the promo videos, with Michael Lindsay Hogg. Godard's approach in filming was to film some bits and pieces, then review it, then decide what to do next. This is really in sync of how the Stones approach their work also. So Tony Richmond was home in London when he got a call from an Elaney Collard. Elaney was to be the producer of that abortion movie. She didn't know Tony but asked if he would like to talk about a movie she's producing. So Tony got picked up in the Rolls-Royce limo, and he was drinking the cognac with Elaney, and they would arrive at Cheyenne Walk Mix House. Tony and Elaney went up the stairs, and Tony mentioned how it reeked of pot, hash. Now Tony walked in, and the stones were just hanging, lying around, strumming a guitar. What a scene that must have been. Godard was sitting in this corner, and Tony was kind of shocked. Godard's assistant brought Tony over and introduced him, and they both talked, and they talked, and they went on through the night. Godard then excused himself to leave, and his assistant told Tony, well, Jean-Luc wants you to do it. He wants you to go to Paris every weekend for three weeks to discuss the movie shooting. Time-wise, this would have been a few weeks before June 5th in May sometime, and we know so much was happening in Paris. They would discuss how to shoot the stone sequences as they knew the ceilings at the Olympic Studios were high. Godard had Tony go to the studio and shoot some black and white tests. What is your function? Lighting cameraman and um, yeah. what? Uh, as a cameraman, uh, lighting cameraman operator. No. And uh, is it the first time you work with John Nicola? Yes. And how do you find him? What, do you find him very different to other directors you work with? Before? Well, yeah, he's very different because everything is very immediate. Um, there's really virtually no camera rehearsals or anything like that. Um, uh, what about the crew you're working with? Is it a different, is it a different crew than those that you normally work with? 
Well, yeah, because we have, um, I mean, normally one would have a, 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 as a camera crew, you'd have a, a lighting cameraman, then a camera operator, focus puller, clapper loader. Um, on this, um, he wants me to operate myself, which, of course, I find very exciting, you know, because it's, it's different, it's unusual. If I didn't do that, um, from the way we shoot, I really wouldn't really know what was going on, you know. I mean, um, because I say we just sit there, and he says, right, we shoot, and... If I wasn't operating myself, I'd never know where the lens was pointing. I see. And what's the film about? Well, it's about uh, two parallel themes. Of one is destruction, the other one, uh, creation. And does Godard work closely with you, or does he keep very much to himself? And is he a very independent type of director than normal, or do you feel that... I think he's very independent. He works... Now, a contract was signed which would say that the film would still go ahead if Brian was in prison following his trial. And June 5th was the first day of the shooting. What was great about the shoot was that the Stones were not performing for the movie, but they were doing it for themselves, their natural behavior, and the crew, they were just voyeurs. We get a feel and in peeking into the Stones' creative process in a studio of how they piece a tune together. Never done before. Also, there's not much footage of Olympic Studios at that time, so we get a real nice glimpse of where and how the next two albums were created. The crew would shoot four nights in a row. Glenn would help them out and set up and assist with the audio, being he knew where they'd all be positioned, and this helped the crew out tremendously. Mick had said, well, it just so happened they caught us at a good time. If it was any other days, then it would have been a real boring session. They covered the beginning till the end of the song. 32 takes of the folky version were filmed and worked on. Now the biggest compliment of making this song, it was tried six different ways, six different styles. We get to see the opening scene where Mick teaching Brian the structure on the acoustic. Mick with the Gibson Hummingbird, Brian with the Gibson J200. Charlie's fluffing around, his kick drum, his mic, and a cushion in his bass drum. And Bill sitting so patiently. They worked on this also the night before. After Keith just talked to Bill, he walks over and sits down with his Gibson Hummingbird in open D, we see the capo there, and he's working with the boys, and they're playing along. Glenn walks in, and at the 323 mark, at the pleased to meet you part, we get a feel how Dylan-esque this tune sounds right now. At the 412 mark comes the part where it's more serious with Keith on the Gibson Black Beauty. He's feeling out of tune, standard tuning, with Bill chugging along, and we get to hear and see Nikki at the organ. Yes, I rode a tank, held a generous rank, when the blitzkeys all red. We also get to see the control room as it looks really intense. And Brian is in his small acoustic space, nodding his head to the rhythm. Five fifty-five. Keith stops to express he cannot hear himself in the headphones, the cans, as Mick relays this to the control room. A little more of Keith on the cans, he I, says. I can't hear myself. Well, Keith, I thought of having the solo on the third, on the fourth one, instead of the... Because that's the way, it's the way it sort of is, you know. The, the last verse is different. Okay. So we'll have it like three verses straight through, and then the solo, whatever it is. Should start off very cool. Should be very cool. Plenty of trials and noodling going on with Keith, 
And we love the banter. Love to hear the banter. Keith at 824 mentions that he wants to move amps and go through the small box as better sound. At 917, what could Mick be talking to Nikki about? Interaction scene at 947 when Brian asked Keith for a button match. At 1025, we hear a solo of what is to become and Keith starting to feel a groove. He's locked in till 11 minutes. At 11.10, Keith is asked if he won't get nasty if he's asked to turn his guitar down. Mick answers back, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Pleased to meet y'all. Oh, fucking hell. you got to come on in that other bit, Charlie. We got to see Bill playing the maracas. There's also long stationary shots taken of Brian from the back of his head. Try and make it a bit more life. It's a bit dead, you know? Not clipped enough somehow. As the Stones were recording, Tony and Godard had to do long takes so the band wouldn't get interrupted. So with Tony being the director of photography and handling the camera shots, Tony had a four-wheel dolly for the slow panning shots. Godard would say, stop. And wherever Tony was, he would stay on one image, not knowing what he would find. Now you see how brightly lit the room is. Keep in mind, when going into a rehearsal or a studio, many musicians like the ambience. Low. Low lighting, dark for atmosphere and feeling. This studio looked like a sun was shining through all the time. This studio was vibrant colors. So let's just say Tony covered the ceiling with hundreds of photo floods, hot lights, and he covered them with tracing paper for a softer top lighting. I listened to Tony Richmond give some lectures, and another crew member and he were discussing something and continued talking as they went downstairs to go to the bathroom at the studio. They were in there having a pee. Then they hear a terrific crash in one of the stalls. And out comes Brian Jones. With his sleeve rolled up, he was holding a hypodermic needle and a string. He had asked Tony if he could tie him up. He did. And Brian went back in the stall, and Tony just continued talking. I'm sure many Brian Jones fans are shaking their head no. But I'm just the messenger here. This was Tony Richmond's experience. At the 3134 mark is where Mick says rode the tank in the general's rank when the SS raids and the body stank. Rode the tank, held the general's rank when the SS raids and the body stank. At 3212, this is where Mick says Kennedy in a singular fashion. Most of us know this story and what it became, plural. The Kennedy version is from the second night. The following third night, it was Kennedy's. God save me. Shout it out. Kill Kennedy. When all the time I knew it was just you and me. We didn't get Keith just so relaxed. 
playing a little tender jam, different sounding guitar tune while mixing sympathy. They have no idea how much this will change. And just notice how relaxed the stones are. They were into their world and they felt good. about 46 minutes 21 seconds when we're brought into the samba riff and we get to see rocky and the rhythm section and keith on his pumping bass line rocky's last name was dizid zornu but keith gave him the name dijon from ghana he played with ginger baker Stevie Wonder, Billy Preston, Joe Walsh, Nick Drake. Look at the control room. Everybody is up. They know they're onto something here. At 51 minute mark, Jimmy gives his input. You couldn't get a groove happening. And you see Mick and Keith, they're chuckling. Okay, yeah, we'll try for a groove. I'm happy with that one. You want to do another one? Okay, we're just making one little correction. Nice. At the 52 minute mark, we see Mick's new friend, co actor from performance, James Fox. He noticed he's getting films, so he decides to walk away. He was doing some character research. 52 minute mark. Mick's talking about a time before. They must have had some kind of groove that he liked. He's also singing, I got no expectations. What was that other beat we were doing? That before, what was that? The, the time, the rehearsal before, what was that beat that we were doing? What's that all about? <laughs> yeah. What's that? It's like completely different. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I got no expectations. Okay. Fifty-three, thirty-eight mark. They know their direction, and Mick says to let Rocky start it. Rocky, start it. At the one hour, nine minute, forty second mark, who, what, and how does that woman that's sitting get in this studio? Mick's leg now shows how much he needs to get this perfect. Hung around for a long, long year. I've stole many a man's soul of fame. I was around when Jesus Christ had his moments of doubt and pain. 
Me damn sure that pilot washed his hands, sealed his face. But we also see their patience and respect for Jimmy. Double time, you don't have to be yet. No, I know, but I just don't I don't have to be singing double time because the bass isn't playing it, but the rhythm's still playing it. Yeah, we couldn't have played yeah, it. Yeah, but it sounds nice if you're not. Yeah. I mean, I think that first verse should be quite close to the way he was singing at the end of the night. Yeah. Okay. We get to see and hear the fabulous woo-hoos. We gotta love Charlie not wanting to give one of those hoo-hoos, just standing there for the camera. Now the other fellow that we see at the 10 o'clock position, that's Michael Cooper, the photographer. Now is that Mary Ann or Suki Portier to the right of Brian? He gives her a gentle touch of love on her back while Anita gives Keith a peck. This is beautiful to watch and hear and see Keith leading and directing. He knows how critical this is and he directs the group. At the 114.19 mark, bring it up. Mick is so into this with his extra nervous energy. He gives his pure master delivery. I'm fucking believable how he did this. At the 126 mark, they're playing a jam. Glenn's discussing with Mick. Charlie's feeling out his oats. And they discuss some direction. Bill's still playing the tune on his acoustic. Notice the bass leaning in the back. At the 129.50 mark, I do believe this is Michelle Breton. She's the one dressed in the suit and hat. Michelle was the second female alongside Anita in performance. And I'm not sure who's this in the purple pants. Stuck around St. Petersburg when I saw it was a time for a change. At the 135 mark starts the end of the beginning. The first cut is done. Now to fulfill the obligation of completing this one plus one movie of Goddard, I need to discuss his destruction portion. Here's the connection of the stones and what Goddard had in his mind. We see a section outside black novel with red letters spelling love. The man sitting in the wheelbarrow is reading from Eldridge Cleaver an autobiography called Soul on Ice from 68. Cleaver was an American black militant. The book is about black alienation in U.S. Cleaver was involved in a shootout in April of 68 in Oakland between the Black Panthers and the police. As it did the Negro musicians mature in awareness of the more instrumental style, possibly as a foil to be used for this naturally vocal style. Classic blues appeared in America. So we hear the man in the wheelbarrow reciting about the blues of the black man and working on convincing us into thinking that black music was exploited by the white men. English version of the Black Panthers actually hired actors from TV series here that are portraying them. We're filmed in a junkyard located at Lombard Wharf, Battersea. A Caucasian woman dressed in white, brutalized, a contrasting visual. More political messages, including voiceovers of Godard's 
other passion and interest, Marxism. Now there's a long segment, a woman wandering in the woods. They're on location, actually, on Tony Pearson's property. That's one of the producers. His estate. She is being interviewed, but with only responding with yes or no. Her name is Eve Democracy, representing political answers like a politician. And this is actually Godard's recent wife, married in 67. And do you think that a woman in the home today, do you think she is miserable? Yes. Do you think the lower classes have more sexual vitality than the upper classes? Yes. She would also be in several other scenes, spray painting revolutionary slogans. This was done real time as they would drive around West London finding locations, hopping out of the car and shoot for a minute and race back in the car and move on. This was real property damage they were doing. Then there's the shot of the bookstore bodega. It was full of Nazi propaganda, men's porn and comic books. Mein Kampf is being recited. Now patrons are entering the store. They pick up a magazine or book and they exchange them for a piece of paper. It's Ian Quarrier playing the role, reading the Mein Kampf. The patron will then walk over to two Maoist hostages and slap them in the face and then give a Nazi salute and they would leave. The last scene is a beach scene with a bloody urban gorillas. It's Eve democracy that collapses and it's Goddard pouring red paint on her body. As her bloody body is lifted up in the crane, and that's the final scene. This is the destruction. All this while well, sympathy is playing in the background. I want to bring this about that a serious dramatic event would happen on the last night of Godard's shooting. Tony Richmond admits this was due to his lighting. That's what he would say. The hot lights on set actually set the Olympic studio on fire. At approximately 4 a.m., while they were jamming, the ceiling started on fire and falling down. Well, Tony, of course, and the crew were concerned about the equipment. Stones were so high, they didn't really give a shit. Here's actually some footage that was taken by the crew, but they didn't take much at all. And Tony would say he really wished that they focused on that fire. That would have been beautiful. Everyone escaped out and firemen came in and had to soak the set and equipment. Thanks to quick thinking, Bill and Jimmy, the tapes were saved. Prior to this fire, Phil Brown, the assistant engineer, he would mention when Mick was working on his vocal track, he saw Marianne write a message in red lipstick to Mick on the control room window. Just very random, it said, burn baby burn, and Mick saw it. Just how bizarre that is. So while Mick was singing, during the take, there was a loud pop sound. Mick looked up to the ceiling and saw a little piece of paper floating down, and so did more debris. He stepped to the side as he was just watching it fall. Everyone saw what was going on. The action was right above the piano, the Hammond, and the amps. Phil had stopped the tape machine, and he said to Glenn, I think we got a fire, we gotta get out of here. He and Glenn entered the studio, and now they saw the fire for real and saw how serious it was. 
a bulb had set fire to the hessian burlap like fabric cloth and then the ceiling insulation caught on where we shot the movie was Barnes Recording Studio, which had started its life as a cinema. And when they turned it into a recording studio, apparently they had a soundproof everything. They put lots and lots of sawdust between the ceiling and the roof, all of this. And we were shooting one, and then suddenly, it was like machine guns. It was going bang, 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 bang. All these lights started to explode. And basically, it happened because it was wired. Got up was fascinating. Now, of course, everybody went into major panic mode up in the stones. Some of them kept playing, and then, then they disappeared. And then, you know, we, we tried to turn the cameras up onto the fire, but then we, you know, being professional movie makers, we, the, the most important thing was to get the cameras out, which really I wish we hadn't. I wish we'd have shot the fire, because it would have been rather exciting. Phil had talked about how he moved the mics away from under the fire. The film crew moved their equipment and turned off all the lights they could. The Stones and Roadies would grab guitars and move amps as the danger progressed. It was only guitars and small amps that were saved. The Hammond, the piano, and large amps would not make it out. Glenn was the one that called the fire department. Jimmy was very cool in this moment and he had his focus on one thing. He had spooled off the 8-track tapes and gathered the boxes of masters. He asked Phil to help carry them out and to make sure all the other masters from the tape storage room were removed. And then when he's done, call a cab. Glenn was still talking to Godard in the studio, still while the fire was raging, and while the fire department bringing in their hoses, but they came in also through the ceiling. All fire escape doors now open, and all have been evacuated after. Flames couldn't be seen from the street, but the smoke can. The fire was put out in 30 minutes and under control, and Phil and Glenn were allowed back in. When they went in, of course, the smell was awful, and there was a hole in the ceiling. Big enough, you could see the sky outside. Godard would catch up with Tony, and he would tell him, Listen, don't say anything, but I'm going back to Paris tomorrow morning. And he was gone. He was gone for two weeks, and production was stalled. Godard would return to London and finish those spray painting scenes in London. So that hole in the ceiling... It remained for about two weeks until they finished recording the album's tunes. While they were recording, they had to stop sometimes whenever a plane flew over. It was later found out that the studio had a load of sawdust in the ceiling. That was used to dampen the sound for the studio. I killed us all and its ministers while Anastasia screamed in vain go to tank held a generous rank when the SS raved and the body stank the opening of the movie Sympathy for the Devil was by Cupid Productions at 1 hour 39 minutes November 29th 1968 so the backstory that's well known, the producers took their own liberties to alter the final version of the movie that Godard completed. Godard was so annoyed at the ending as it was unauthorized. Ian Quarrier would change the title and also insert the full and completed Sympathy for the Devil song, the album cut. The original title is One Plus One. Godard had specific intentions of the ending by having an unfinished version of the song at the end. His artistic mind was in thinking that art is never finished. There's no ending or it should not be complete. So Godard was furious and so critical of what the producers had done to his work. Now his art is finished. At the opening, Ian Quarrier was speaking at a podium, 
Godard had gone up to the mic stand where Ian was, and he punched him in the head. He wanted the audience to get their money back and to donate it to Eldridge Cleaver, his defense fund. Godard had received his version of the movie from Tony Richmond. He would say at that podium, this is not my film. My film is being screened outside. He had arranged for projectors outside. He knew ahead he wanted the theater burned down. However, it was raining outside. The attendees would boo him, and Godard would end up calling them fascists. Eventually, Godard would end up talking to Mick to see if he could influence the producers to put back his ending of the version. Well, this didn't happen. Tony Richmond knew a lot of people did not understand what this film was about, creation and destruction, and that it's never finished. Keith would write in his book Life, and he mentions... Where was Godard going? No plan. The film was a total load of crap. He was surprised, as he said, Godard, up until then, was making well-crafted movies, Hitchcockian work. In the early 70s, this movie was shown as a double feature along with Gimme Shelter. So after all that was said and done, the star of the movie was the song. And probably for most of us, Stones fans would agree. Now to the song and the lyrics. Narration exhibits narcissistic delight. It recalls the escapades over the course of human history and the dark side of mankind. The opening lyrics are pretty obvious, but pure. 100% pure. Absolute. Sheer, downright brilliance. All of it. The first lines were originally, Please let me introduce myself. Ain't I a man of wealth and taste? One, two, three, four. Please let me introduce myself. I'm a man. Also, pleased to meet y'all. These lines were grammatically corrected. It leads into the trial of Jesus. We have talked now with the Russian Revolution from 1917-18 and the Romanov family execution. Especially the line, Anastasia screamed in vain. The revolution brought on the rise of communism. Anastasia being one of Tsar Nicholas's daughters, supposedly not all the daughters perished from the Bolsheviks killing and execution of most of the family. World War II, the devil is incognito. I rode a tank, held a general's rank when the blitzkrieg raged and the body stank. Mick did have the prior lyrics, as I mentioned and displayed earlier. I rode a tank when the SS raids and the body stank. Blitzkrieg, the meaning, lightning war in German. A short conflict. I watched with glee while your kings and queens fought for ten decades for the gods they made. Relates to the Hundred Year War atrocities of England and France in the 14th, 15th century. As you can imagine, this is one hell of a story in time. And on June 6th and June 7th, when Mick sang Kennedy and changed it to Kennedy's, as sadly Bobby was assassinated. Not going to go there, but I'm just going to mention, I did have about two pages of stories of this topic for the Troubadours before they reached Bombay. But I'm just going to keep it brief here. Several discussions about this. Can't be sure, of course. Let's first understand what a troubadour means. Relating to music or poetry, a composer or a performer. So we have some that think they represent the Beatles, being they were just in India. 
There were robbers and killers and murderers also known as the Thugi cult, hence the term thug. They were assaulting travelers on roads in India. Now also in the 60s, many hippies who took on the beatnik philosophy, they would travel through these side roads, be robbed and violated. These lyrics are ones that got them in trouble. The lyrics are just as every cop is a criminal and all the sinners saints. This was totally misinterpreted by many. A metaphor and not meant for violence, which is what folks would interpret it as. Violence against police. We know there was real tensions filling that time frame with police in the world. The song would be banned by some radio stations and got criticism from the law. And a listener is warned, however, to be nice, give some sympathy, or he's going to turn. So if you meet me, have some courtesy, have some sympathy and some taste, use all your well-learned politics, or I'll lay your soul to waste. Powerful, effective, and to the point. Let's confirm politics is politeness or etiquette. Use all your politeness or I'll lay your soul to waste. So what do we got here? We got Lucifer explaining all the interactions that he had throughout history. The problem doesn't come from external entities, but the devil is us, mankind, which is why we keep hearing, hope you guess my name. It is you and I. We are the devil and evil. You know, God changed the devil's name from Lucifer to Satan when he got expelled from heaven. Keith would say it's all about looking the devil in the eyes, right in his face. He's there all the time. Evil people tend to bury it and hope it sorts out by itself and doesn't rear its ugly head. Don't forget him. If you confront him, then he's out of a job. That was Keats' 2022 definition. It took a lot of balls to make this tune. I should not really need to break this tune down, but will, as it is just so fucking good. First off, hats off to Jimmy Miller for pulling the album to masterpiece level. I have talked about his genius work plenty in several documentaries. Remember, Jimmy was about the groove. This didn't happen by accident. It would be Jimmy that put the icing on many of these tunes. Let me have some fun now, playing some of the isolated pieces of this tune. Gonna kick off with little pieces of Nicky. Keats pounding, pounding rhythm of bass. I have to add this, that when I hear this bass riff that Keith plays, can't help but think of Iggy Pop's Lust for Life. Thank you. 
we get to hear some of Brian's acoustic strumming. Very low in the mix. When you hear the opening of this tune, it's so crisp, so clear, so simple, so in front, takes our breath away. Mixed vocals are just so pure, like a glacial stream, and it's chilling. We hear his yows and then hear the girls giggling for three seconds. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Rocky just doing his thing. Keith Space and Nikki and the percussions. It is so cool how the bass starts off so simple and then goes into a rhythm frenzy. Just like all the other instruments. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many a man's soul and faith. I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment. Not on the original, but when I hear this isolated version of Mick singing, I just got to add this. Doubt and pain Me damn sure the pilot Washed his hands and sealed his fate. Ooh. And eventually it goes into the woohoos. They come in. They don't dominate. Used as a nice simple instrument. We all have that visual memory now with Keith leading them. Now bring this story up now with Anita. She heard Jimmy talking to himself in the control room. Jimmy saying, who you singing about, Mick? Who, who? And he repeated who, who a few times. Anita would tell Mick what just went on in the control room and suggested to use that as backing vocals. The Stones tried it and after the first take, it would more from the hoo-hoos to the woo-woos. I had mentioned about with the hoo-hoos, that seventh person in the group shot. Not Jimmy Miller, as many people say it is. Michael Cooper is the seventh person. Michael is mentioned throughout, and he needs a little attention. He met up with Robert Fraser at the peak London swinging times and became close with the Stones and the Beatles and photographed plenty of their early period. Some brilliant photos. He even lived with Keith and Anita at one time. He did the Sgt. Pepper and Satanic album covers. Sadly, he would die of suicide from depression and heroin addiction in 1973 at the age of 31. At 2.48, we get that masterful Keith solo that cuts through like a hot blade through butter. It's so piercing. This is proof, again, that faster is not better. At 3.23, that guitar 
All I could say is the POW slide. Simple playing of a melodic lead can do the job. No need for the blistering fast notes. As the song drifts into the end and you can catch a listen to Charlie's cymbal crashing around 4.33. Mick and Keith, they trade off solos. 5.29, Nikki's piano is phenomenal, along into Mick's falsettos. performance I can't even find words except to say it's outside our galaxy his delivery is just pure genius rock and roll <laughs> As we stop and think about this, how could they have cooked this tune up and brought us their version of Mozart? This is another stamp of why the Stones are the Stones and the greatest ever. Sympathy is the number seven all-time song the Stones played live, 827 times. Now, as you see on this list, really cool list from GuestSpectacular.com, it shows Sympathy for the Devil from 68 to 2022 on how many times it was played. The black background is the events, the tours, the amount of shows they played for each year. And the red line shows the sympathy, how many times they played it on the tour. You'll notice 1981 was one time. That was located in Worcester, Massachusetts. In 1972, they played it once in San Diego. But there was a gap, 72 to 73, 78, 81. And as the years went on, the tune did decline as the tour dates did also.
So there you have it. Part two. As you can imagine, there's more to come. And as you can see, the amount of work and effort put into these. From a fan for the fan. The donators who've helped out, as I show and list you here, thank you so, so, so much. Been really helpful. And I think it's very cool for you to do that. Those of you who haven't, Hopefully you see some value in what I provide you and throw a contribution through PayPal. It's so appreciated. And for the contributors, going to let you in on something. I'm thinking to create a special project just for you to see. And I'll keep you informed through the PayPal. Keep rocking. And we'll enjoy that new Stones album. <laughs>